Good evening, everybody. I'm Sunil Amrath, the uh, Interim Director of the Mahindra Humanities Center, and um, on behalf of, of all my colleagues in the Humanities Center, um, I'm, I'm delighted to see so many of you here today for the first of uh, three exciting events under the banner of Border in Humanities. Migration has been at the heart of the Mahindra Center's programming for the last few years. Uh, we have a Mellon program on migration and the humanities, which um, above all brings us our six postdoctoral fellows. And this year, as in previous years, we have a wonderful group of fellows uh, approaching migration and the humanities from a uh, diverse range of, of disciplinary perspectives. Um, today, we're here to talk about migration and inhumanity. Um, I'm very grateful to my colleagues uh, Bruno Carvalho, Kirsten Weld, Gabriela Soto La Viega for insisting that at this moment we can't and we shouldn't look away from the moral and political crisis that confronts us with migrant detention on the southern border of the United States. Um, we're incredibly fortunate to have uh, this evening and over the next two events uh, a wonderful group of scholars, activists, physicians, curators, all of whom have engaged in a very direct way with migration and detention on the U.S. southern border. Um, so I'd like to invite my friend and colleague Bruno Carvalho, Professor of Romance, Languages and Literatures here at Harvard and co-director of the Harvard Mellon Urban Initiative uh, to uh, take the reins and who will facilitate today's discussion. Uh, Bruno, uh, welcome. Thank you all for being here. Thank you, Sunil, for embracing our, our, our idea of a series on border and humanities. To my colleagues, Kirsten Weld, um, Gabriela, for co-organizing, and I especially want to thank uh, Stephen Beal for his uh, vision, his support. Uh, Mary McKinnon, um, Jose Rivera, and Daria Lugina for making this possible. So as we gather here tonight, there are folks throughout this country living in terror of deportation or incarceration without a clear or viable path to citizenship or documented status used as political cudgels by we know who. There are growing numbers of Central American asylum seekers in Mexico turned back to face unspeakable horrors, including kidnapping, rape, murder, and there are, of course, incarceration and detention centers or camps increasingly on both sides of the U.S.-Mexico border, that once porous space. So how did we get here, and what can we do? Amid climate change, geopolitical instabilities, um, authoritarian nationalism, we can expect that in our century, borders will continue to generate cruelty, but also networks of solidarity. In this series, we bring together folks with different specializations, but shared commitments to justice, to rights, and who can help us face our challenges with attention to the social and human dimensions of policy, design, language, medicine, history, and so on. In this first conversation, we'll focus on detention centers or camps. We'll announce more details soon about the next uh, two panels which will also bring together uh, approaches often uh, kept apart. Uh, those will include other borders as well. Tonight, we are so grateful for the work that each of our speakers do, and we are so grateful that they've so generally see, generously agreed to um, be with us. So thank you, Tanya, Yolanda, Sarah. Um, each will speak for 15 minutes and we'll open it up, so we should have plenty of time to, to, to make it an actual uh, conversation. So uh, uh, in interest of, of getting right to it, I'll be very brief in, in my introductions, and I'll introduce all three at once. Tania Caballero is an assistant professor in pediatrics at um, John Hopkins School of Medicine. She has written movingly and forcefully about the long-term consequences to children of the experiences of family separation and detention. Yolanda Chavez Leiva was born in Juarez, grew up in El Paso, is associate professor of history at the University of Texas in El Paso, where among other things, she directs the Institute of Oral History and co-founded the Museo Urbano. 
as a researcher and practitioner, Yolanda bridges border history, public history, Chicana history, and social work. Her writing um, on the white supremacist terrorist attack last year in El Paso is uh, exemplary of how history is never just about the past. Last, Sarah Lopez, Associate Professor of Architecture at UT Austin. Sarah's brilliant book, Remittance Landscapes, which we read in one of my seminars today, shows how uh, trans-border lives have reshaped built environments in both rural Mexico and urban US. And years before detention centers made headlines, Sarah was already researching and engaging in pedagogical work connected to their architecture and construction. So we look forward to hearing each of you. Please joining me, join me in welcoming um, Sara, Tanya, and Yolanda, and Tanya to the podium. Hello, everyone. Um, so thank you so much for inviting me to speak tonight. Um, Boston's actually a special place in my heart. My father immigrated here uh, from Argentina via Guatemala in the 80s, and he started his academic career here. And I had my first few steps and first couple of years here on this campus. So it's been a really nice experience coming back. Um, so I'm a pediatrician in Baltimore City, and I work in a clinic where I'm mostly serving immigrant families. Um, I also work with the National Pediatric Clinical and Advocacy Association called the um, American Academy of Pediatrics on a council called Immigrant Child and Family Health. So I thought tonight it would be a good idea to describe briefly the different ways that children and family units are processed at our borders and specific aspects of the current system that put children's safety and health at risk. I'll also touch on what I see in my clinic once immigrant children make it to my city and my practice. So first off, any amount of detention is inappropriate and unsafe for children. Children are developmentally, emotionally, and physically very vulnerable. They need education, play, nutrition, they need safe social and emotional security, and they need to be with family. So our detention and processing systems are siloed systems. They provide fractured, inconsistent quality of care, and they are not designed for our fragile, ill, and vulnerable populations, such as children. So first, I want to touch upon uh, one system where family units are processed. So this is a Customs and Border Patrol, CBP, that people may be familiar with. This is under the Department of Homeland Security. The Department of Homeland Security also runs Interior Enforcement, which we know as ICE. So these two are very security-focused institutions. So CBP is where family units and adults over 18 years old are processed. And after presenting to the border and they're processed, uh, families can be released into the community. Uh, where they may check in with an ICE official uh, regularly until their court date. They may wear one of the um, ankle bracelets as well, and they're responsible for checking in, and, um, but they're allowed to live in the community, and their children are supposed to be enrolled in school and things like that. Um, people may also end up in an ICE-run facility in the interior where families will be detained together for a period of time. And more recently, families are also being sent back to Mexico. So it's really inconsistent um, who gets to go where and why. And CBP is where the child deaths occurred that we heard about in the past couple months. So these facilities are not child and family friendly. People are not meant to spend more than 72 hours in these facilities, but they do. And children, although they're with a family member, are in these cold jail-like conditions that can be extremely terrifying. And what's concerning for us is the lack of pediatric trained medical providers um, who, because as we know, children can present very differently. You have kids who are coming across a border who've been exposed to extreme conditions, dehydration, they're at risk for shock, and children can decompensate very quickly. And you really need a pediatric trained provider to quickly um, identify, assess, and treat a child who's in acute medical need. And so within the academy, we've provided testimony in, um, a, a month ago 
urging uh, CBP facilities to really um, have pediatric trained people assess children. And unfortunately, too, some of these medical assessments in CBP are done sort of inconsistently. A lot of times the care is um, a medical exam is done for children who are maybe younger than 12. But we really argue these, these are Every, everybody should get a medical assessment, and particularly the body of an 18, 17, 16-year-old still should be assessed by a pediatrician. So our concern is that we don't have the sort of right approach to medical care as kids are being processed and coming from very extreme physical conditions, not, let alone mental conditions. And further, families are being put at risk by being forced to wait in Mexico for their court proceedings through the Migrant Protection Protocol, MPP, which we'll talk a little bit more about later. And this program really fundamentally dismantles the asylum process as we know it. So people stay, people go back to Mexico, stay in border towns and shelters and different facilities where, as we had mentioned, they're at risk for kidnapping, gang-related violence, um, extortion, and further, again, further traumatization. And so we're putting children and families back in, the, back in places where they're feeling re-traumatized, having new trauma, and also exposing their caregivers to um, potentially worsening me medical conditions. So if you have a parent who is a diabetic or you have a parent who has very severe asthma, everybody, the parents too, are at risk of getting ill. And medical and legal care and providing care, having people come and provide care in these facilities is extremely dangerous too. So we're further isolating our families um, and isolating the needs that they, that they deserve by putting them acro back across the border. So now, if you have a child who crosses the border alone, they're processed through the Office of Refugee Resettlement, that's ORR, and that is run by the Department of Health and Human Services. So that is different from um, Homeland Security. And HHS, or, or um, Health and Human Services, they come from sort of a health and family-focused lens. And they have the important job of protecting vulnerable children who come alone. So unaccompanied children um, have a particular risk of, for human trafficking, kidnapping, gang violence. And because they also made the journey alone, they have a lot of trauma, potential risk for trauma, physical, emotional, sexual abuse, things like that. So ORR is specifically designed to attend to children who are alone. And these facilities do offer education, a bit more physical freedom, um, more humane conditions, and more cooperation with pediatricians. Um, however, the quality of these facilities really do vary. As I mentioned, this is sort of a fractured network of, of experiences and services that people get. And so you may have some places that offer resources for mental health um, and medical care, but this can really vary. And some of the facilities are really large, which can be, real, which can be difficult. And the smaller facilities will be able to provide um, more sort of individualized care and attention to kids who are really in need. Because ultimately, these kids have no adult caregiver with them. They have guards, they have therapists potentially there, um, but these kids are alone. So this is an extremely vulnerable group of children. Um, and it's really important to understand the different um, systems that these families and children can come through when they uh, get to me in, from where they're, where, where they're coming from. So then they get to me in Baltimore. And so then that experience can be very different based on where and with whom they were processed. And so, as I mentioned, once people finally make it to their final destination, um, they may, the children come to our clinics in various conditions. And so, we've found that with the disorganization and inconsistencies of how families are processed, make it oftentimes difficult to understand what they need and um, what they, you know, for their first appointment with us. So some children may come without vaccine records, um, a vague history of a medical diagnosis, but oftentimes we're sort of scrambling to put some of these pieces together. 
Um, you know, do they have asthma? Do they have a, a con medications for a chronic medical con condition? Sometimes records and medications get lost in facilities. Children may have come alone, and they're, we ask them if they've been treated for any medical conditions. They don't know. Someone gave them some medicine at some point in the facilities. So it's really hard sometimes to piece together the experience that they've had in detention before coming to us, let alone having a child process everything that's happened to them in their home country and their journey. Um, so it really is a long process. Um, and there are incredibly limited resources also to connect a child, for example, who, let's say, was receiving mental health therapy within an uh, ORR facility. Connecting them out to a service in the community is really difficult, and ORR just doesn't have the funds to connect every single child to a therapist in a particular community. Um, so that's really difficult, too. A child may have had some intensive therapy or something during their um, their time of detention, but that handoff is just not happening. They just don't have the capacity to do that for every child. You will, you may have kids with medically complex conditions. So this is like a kid with a seizure disorder or something like that. Most of the energies from ORR are made in those kids and getting those kids connected with some kind of charity care that will accept, um, will accept them and take on their medical services. Again, we're talking about kids that don't have health insurance, and oftentimes they don't qualify for insurance. So it takes a lot of work and effort to find a uh, perhaps a subspecialist who will take care of their bone disease or their cerebral palsy or their seizure disorder or, or cystic fibrosis or something like that. So it really is a lot of work and a lot of energy and a small amount of resources if you're really going to do it right. Um, and in my clinic, so, you know, as I see kids over time, you know, kids are learning new languages, uh, a new language, English, struggling to adjust to a new school system, sometimes a new family. Some kids are reunited with family members, perhaps a parent who they haven't been, um, they were raised by a grandparent for a decade, and then they come here and they're reunited with their mom who they've never known as a child and they miss their grandmother, their mom has a new spouse, a younger half-sibling, there's all these new rules. It's a really, really difficult adjustment period. And some of this we've seen has re resulted in anxiety, depression, suicidal thoughts, suicidal attempts. Um, and so that's even just talking about the assimilation experience, again, let alone whatever they had experienced in detention or the trip or their original uh, country of origin. So I think about detention as sort of a continuum of their entire experience. This is one stop. So oftentimes for kids, contextualizing that as a sort of pivotal turning point it may be difficult because they've experienced a lot before this. And maybe you know three months in jail or three weeks in jail in the grand scheme of things is really hard for them to put a lot of weight on because they're processing so many other things. Um, you know, for example, I had a, you know, a teenager who was th threatened and raped in her home country. She came here, she had a baby, and now she's dealing with the trauma of her experiences, but also the complex emotions that come with raising a, a baby, a, a child that she's needs, that she has to connect with and process. Um, I had a, an immigrant mother with a US born child who was telling me, oh, these, these immigrant kids in my kids' sixth grade class, they're all the troublemakers. They let in all these kids who are troublemakers. And I said, well, you know, they're experiencing so much stress coming in here. You know, it's trauma, they're stressed, they're hurt. And then she broke down and cried and said, I would never want my own child to, I have a child in my home country who I would never want to bring here because I never want her to go through what I went through when I crossed. And she, and I didn't even have any idea that she had a 20 year old daughter at home who she hasn't seen for decades. So I think that a lot of times it's really hard to unearth some of these traumas that, that people experience. And I think for children, um, it's complex because it comes out in different ways and different behaviors, anxiety, depression. Um, and for parents in particular, it's also very complicated. 
So we know that maternal health in particular has an effect on child health. And so if you have a depressed, anxious mother who's been through a lot of trauma, even if her and her baby were processed fairly quickly through CBP, came together, you know, I see them within a couple of days of, you know, they arrived a month prior and everything was very quick, you know, that mother is still struggling to um, process what she's been going through while raising her, her child. And we know that that anxiety, you know, the children can feel that and, and it affects how they grow and how they develop and how they bond with their caregiver. Um, and so, you know, these are experiences that deserve attention and resources and should be appro approached with dignity and respect. But, we, but it's very difficult in the system that doesn't value mental health, and especially for those who don't have insurance or access to insurance. So we find that we really struggle to find resources for these families once they're in our communities because they don't have access to insurance. Um, some of the things that we've been doing is group you know, a, a group therapy kind of thing that's run in the community, um, but it's really hard to do um, trauma and trauma-based care and trauma-focused, highly trained um, care for, for kids and families because that takes a lot of resources and effort and we just don't have the, the capacity. Um, but I'd say that, you know, the good news is, is that these, fa these families are incredibly resilient people. Um, and besides supporting children in our communities with sort of safe spaces, safe play, um, education, I think there's also a space to support parents. Um, like I said, so much of their health is tied to their children's health. And these families have experienced so much stress and trauma, yet they're here. Their kids go to school. Their kids take violin lessons. They love math. You know, it's it's really, uh, it's difficult, but it's so enjoyable, and it gives me hope to think that with the right kind of community support, um, many of these families will be able to thrive. Um, and we have a lot of fights on a lot of fronts, on the federal level, state level, um, some of the work that we're doing in the Academy of Pediatrics and other areas. But um, I believe that, you know, with all these going on too, a lot of things can be assessed locally, things like being a big brother or big sister, volunteering at a shelter, um, you know, perhaps donating um, your time or your finances to a legal um, an immigration clinic or something like that. Those things can all help locally, um, help your own community build strength and trust and bring these families into our communities to really thrive because um, they're not that different from us. You know, we try to put a lot of, we try to make a lot of differences, but these families are so much like us. And so I think that if we rally around things that are similar, we'll really find our strength. So thank you so much and looking forward to the discussion. Good evening, everybody. I am thrilled to be here, and I want to thank the Humanities Center for the invitation to come. I am not thrilled that we have a panel titled Bordering Humanities. I'm going to be talking about the situation really from the perspective of El Paso Ciudad Juarez, where I live and where I work, and bringing in some of the stories that we have from people who have not yet made it to the communities that Tanya talks about, mm -hmm. but are still in the midst of trying to figure out how to get to the United States. Will they get to the United States? What will their life be like? And I've titled it, Did You Have to Make Us Suffer So Much? Bec well, I'll let you listen to, to it right now. The young man that you see here on the screen, we'll call him Freddie, was a teenager when he crossed the border. He crossed alone. His brother and his father had been in the United States for many years already, and it got to the point in Honduras where he felt like he needed to do something to help his mother, who was very sick. So he decided to cross. I had the privilege of meeting him last April. We did a two-hour oral history with him. Entonces, vuelvo y repito, gracias porque lo dieron la oportunidad. 
pero no tenían que hacerlo sufrir tanto. And what he said right now, thank you for the opportunity, but you didn't have to make us suffer so much. That has stayed with me. Because he was so grateful. He was allowed to go to his sponsor. He's in high school, trying to learn English. But he said, did we have to suffer so much? Today, I left the hotel briefly to explore. And as I turned the corner, I walked in front of the Cambridge Baptist Church. And I was first drawn because they have a sign that says Black Lives Matter, so I went up to that. And then I saw they had the photos of seven of the children who have died in CBP custody in the past year. And I started to cry to see the little faces of the children, two of who died in my hometown. And I thought, you know, very often I have to leave the border physically in order to feel like I can breathe. And I was feeling like I can breathe, I can breathe, I'm far away. And as soon as I saw those, those photographs, I said, the border is over here too. There are people here too who recognize what's happening where I live. This is a map of the US-Mexico border. So El Paso, the cursor's not showing up, is it? El Paso, for most of the 20th century, was the most important port of entry into the United States from Mexico. And it still remains an extremely important site. We have a long history of refugees. Here are some photos taken by Otis Altman at the turn of the century that we have in special collections at UTEP that show Mexican refugees crossing the border into El Paso. We also have a long history of being a laboratory for federal immigration policy. Nineteen ninety-three, Silvestre Reyes, who was then heading the Border Patrol sector there, started what's, what first was known as Operation Blockade, then became Operation Hold the Line, where for a twenty-mile stretch between El Paso and Juarez. Border Patrol were stationed in their cars facing the border within eyesight of each other. What hold the line resulted in is in pushing people away from this urban crossing area of Juarez and El Paso to an extremely dangerous, deadly crossing from Sonora to Arizona. And Last year, an average of one person died every two days trying to cross the Arizona desert. And you know, the Arizona desert has a lot of volcanic rock in it. People actually start to cook as they walk across it. It gets so hot. You heard this in the previous presentation that there are levels of trauma let me play you a little snippet from a Cuban asylum seeker. She was seeking asylum both as a lesbian who had been persecuted a lot and also as a political asylum seeker. irse de su país porque ya mi vida estaba ya estaba en peligro ya ya mi vida estaba estaba en peligro y no no que no quería que me, me hicieran nada de, delante de los ojos de mi mamá que si me lo iban a hacer me lo hicieran lejos de, 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 de los ojos de mi mamá para que no sufriera porque mi mamá está sufriendo todo esto que me está pasando a mí I chose this little snippet where she talks about how she received a lot of threats in her home country, and she didn't want those threats or for anything to happen to her in front of her mother because she didn't want her mother to suffer. 
So asylum seekers come with this history of terror, persecution, extreme poverty, violence from their home countries. They then go through the horror of 2,000 miles of getting to the border where they experience hunger, cold, sickness, now attacks by the Mexican authorities, where their children get sick. If they don't have money, they hitch rides. And imagine traveling as a woman with two children and hitching rides the whole 2,000 miles. I'm going to tell you the story of a woman who did that. Once they get here and they ask for asylum, then they have the trauma of detention that you just heard about in the yeleras, in the ice boxes, in the perreras, in the dog kennels. In the past year, the administration has had the idea to add a fourth level of trauma, and that's being returned to Mexico under MPP. Family separation started in El Paso as a pilot project. Even though it's supposed to have stopped, the government has found insidious ways to separate families. Thousands of children were separated from their parents. It's believed that during the official period of zero tolerance where parents were being incarcerated and separated from their children, as a conscious deterrent to coming to the United States, that over 6,500 families were affected. Over 2,500 children were separated from their families. That we know, and we don't really know. We also know there's children that have not been returned or reunited with their families because no one kept records. Children who either cross the border unaccompanied, like Freddie, or who were separated from their families ended up, as you heard already, in centers run by ORR. In Tornillo, which is about an hour east of El Paso, ORR contracted with the Baptist Family and Children's Services to build this detention camp for youth. It opened in the summer of 2018 and it closed in January of 2019. At its height, it had over 2,600 kids. It was at that time the largest detention center for children. And it was not only an expansive place, it was a secretive place. No one was allowed in, even elected officials had a hard time going in. In November of 2018, a group of attorneys and psychologists were allowed to go in to see how the kids were doing and what they found was children who were depressed, children who were traumatized, children who didn't know where they were in the United States, who didn't know when they would get out, who didn't understand why they were in a prison, who didn't know if they would ever see their parents again. And children who were threatened by staff, you question too much, you might not ever get out of here. It closed, as I said, in January of 2019. Baptist Child and Family Services was getting a lot of bad PR and one of their mottos is we do God's work, so they were very sensitive to that. A priest, Father Rafael Garcia, who was going in there to give mass, said to him it was like a combination of a concentration camp and Disneyland, because you would have movie nights and you would have ice cream nights, but still the children were behind barbed wire. There's an organization in my city, the Hope Border Institute, and I'm not gonna go through this little chart, but I wanted to point out that 
if you want some very easy to understand infographics about how all these systems work, go to Hope, Hope Border Institute and you'll find things like this, this flow chart that shows you how do you end up in, remain in Mexico. The migrant protection protocols has resulted in somewhere between 15,000 and 17,000 migrants being sent to Ciudad Juarez. 15 to 17,000 people released to the streets. There are shelters in Juarez. There's a federal shelter, a state-run shelter, a Catholic church-run shelters, Protestant church-run shelters. And just like it varies very much on this side, the quality of where you end up, it varies a great deal on the Mexican side as well. Sometimes families get together and rent tiny hotel rooms nightly so they can stay there. Sometimes they go to a shelter. They are vulnerable to kidnapping, to extortion, to rape. And when we talk about MPP, when we talk about Remain in Mexico, we're talking about a system that targets women and children. The most vulnerable people, often without any resources whatsoever. When people cross the border to turn themselves in for asylum, the Border Patrol has the history of taking everything they have that they don't have on their bodies. If they have two sweaters, one is taken. If they have medication, it could be taken. Sometimes their papers are taken, and all of that is thrown away. So then you have people being sent to Mexican border cities who literally have nothing but the clothes that they're wearing. When they're here, and you heard about this too, about the yeleras, the yeleras are often kept at 60 degrees. Supposedly, so the germs don't multiply. And people are sleeping on the floor. People have, I, I brought a blanket to show you. And this is an extra large one. This is what people are given to keep them warm. in 60 degree rooms where they're sleeping on concrete floors. When I was volunteering at one of the shelters on the Ecpaso side, I knew when people were just out of the llaneras because every child was <coughs> sick. Every child had respiratory problems. A year ago, in March of 2019, the Border Patrol created this detention center under the international bridge between El Paso and Juarez. They encaged hundreds of migrants who then slept on gravel under the bridge where people walk from El Paso to Juarez and walk back from Juarez to El Paso, so they could hear people above them walking. They, it was kind of like the weather this afternoon. You know how this afternoon was sunny, yet it was pretty cold, and then the wind? That was the weather that would, was in El Paso when people were put under the International Bridge in cage by barbed wire with the kind of blanket that I just showed you. y o la mía y mi niña me mandaron para atrás. Aparte de que sufrimos en el camino, sufrimos todo, la, el secuestro, el, vengo sufriendo en Honduras, vine a sufrir con mi hija porque cuando yo entré a inmigración me tuvieron debajo del puente dos días. De ahí con mi hija enferma me llevaron para un campamento y sin ayuda, sin ayuda médica, no me dieron ayuda médica a la niña. Me mandaron para Juárez y mi hija venía enferma todavía. 
en casa del inmigrante me la llevaron al hospital. Do you hear the pain in her voice? She had come from Honduras, and she's a great example of that insidious way that families continue to be separated after the end of family separation. She came with her daughter, her husband, and her son. They spent five days under this bridge. Her daughter got very ill, wouldn't respond, wouldn't stand up, wouldn't speak, wouldn't open her eyes, and wouldn't eat. And she kept saying, my baby's sick, my baby's sick. And what she told me, the Border Patrol told her was like, well, she's not dead yet. She went to the hospital with her child, and while she was with her child in the hospital, her husband and son were released to their sponsors. When she got out with her daughter, MPP was in place, so she and her daughter were returned to Juarez. So she and her daughter were in Juarez. They had already been subject to kidnapping. She had been raped twice. <laughs> and her husband and son were with their sponsors. Just to, to end with a little bit about life under MPP. The people you see here, and you know, we, we can't show their faces, none of the names are, are real. The people you see here, the women and children you see here, are two indigenous families from Guatemala. The man on the right is a longtime activist. The woman in the blue, she's holding her four-year-old and her 10-year-old is standing next to her. She had come from Guatemala because she was living in a very dangerous situation for her. So they came, they crossed at Sasabe, Arizona, and they were put into MPP in Nogales, Sonora. But their court date was in El Paso, hundreds of miles away. This is not just an accident. It's not just something that happens. It's a way to keep people from making their court dates so that they can't get to their court date in another city, in another state, which results in an automatic order of deportation. But guess what? She made it. So I met her the day after she got to Juarez with her friend who is standing to the side of her with her two children. Also, from an indigenous village in, in Guatemala. So she went to her first court date, and her first language is Acateco. So they asked her, do you want a translator? She speaks Spanish perfectly, but she would feel more comfortable in her own language, so she said yes. So they kept her in a yelera for two weeks, saying that they couldn't find a translator. Her older child cried himself to sleep every day. The little one stopped eating. They finally released her. They sent her to Juarez. She had spent two days in a shelter in Juarez when she arrived from Nogales. When she got back to the shelter in Juarez, they had thrown away all her belongings, the belongings that she had acquired while staying in Nogales. So they didn't have any clothes except the clothes they had on. They were very cold. And you know, I was what's apping her all the time. And I said, well, and I also couldn't see her. I couldn't, I was not allowed to go into the shelter. So I said, what do you need? And she said, clothes, something to keep my children warm. So my generous colleagues donated money, I went shopping, I, I had warm clothes for the three of them. I sent the clothes to an activist in Juarez who's very well known at the shelters because I figured if anyone can get the clothes to her, she can. 
So she got there and they said, nope, you can't give her the clothes. So I got a uh, WhatsApp message from the activist that night, and she says, Yolanda, they didn't let me give her the clothes, but let's just say I got them to her. So if you see me on the news tonight, you know why. <laughs> so I don't know what she did, but she got the clothes to her the night before her, her second court date. So she went, and you know, when, when people are getting ready to go to court, they're both scared, but they also have hope. Maybe they'll let me in. Maybe they will. So she was hopeful. She went to her second court date, and all they did was say, here's your third court date in January of 2021. Where would she live? She couldn't stay at the shelter for a year. So I got a message from her last week saying she thought she would just have to go back to Guatemala, to the danger. And she did. You know, the reality of how these federal policies play out in people's lives are more horrible than we can imagine. So through our oral history project, which we call Seeking Refuge, we seek to document the stories of people who are in the midst of this suffering, who are in the midst of this trauma because as they often tell us, we want people to know what we went through. We need people to know the truth. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. I'm really excited to be here and be a part of this. And this is, has been a quite emotional set of presentations so far. Um, uh, hopefully I can add another dimension to it. While, why do we have to pay attention to the material history as we turn our attention towards the shameful present as we've been hearing about occurring at the US-Mexico boundary? Uh, the questions I ask include, to what extent does architecture and infrastructure facilitate, foment, enable, and strengthen the current inhumanities? So just very briefly to situate myself, especially in relationship to the last two speakers you just heard, as an architectural historian interested in the relationship between migration and the built environment, and more specifically, the spaces of migrant detention as one critical point along a migrant's journey, a fateful point, I view detention centers themselves as greatly contributing to the qualities and characteristics that define a US penal migration landscape today. So let's take a moment to think about the role that architecture, construction, plays through the lived experiences and through the representations of criminality through spatial networks and systems in the experience of the innocent but incarcerated. We can start with the building of Ellis Island in 1892 where architectural record writes, what a great thing it is not only for America but for humanity that there should be so vast an asylum opened for the crowded out, the residuum of other lands. It's an aesthetic requirement that this lavish hospitality and worldwide welcome should be expressed in the architecture. I'm not gonna go into the ways that Ellis Island, as one of our earliest det detention centers, failed to provide lavish hospitality, but it's important to note that detention centers have always been symbolic places with national significance. Also, technically, they functioned as places to quarantine individuals awaiting a legal process that will then determine if they're imprisoned, deported, or released. So that has been the case since the Geary Act of 1892, which established detention and deportation in the context of rising Chinese migration to the US. The Geary Act was an extension of the Chinese Exclusion Act, and it forced Chinese laborers to carry internal resident permits Failure to do so would lead to detention and deportation. Um, and Kelly Lyle Hernandez's a recent book, City of Inmates, does a great job of contextualizing that act in this moment. So you see here a quote from the 1890s, from the period of when that act was established by the Supreme Court. Quote, deportation is not a punishment for a crime. And quote, detention is not imprisonment in a legal sense. And that's actually similar to a quote you see below it from 2009 which is actually from a former ICE employee saying, quote, immigrant, immigration proceedings and civil proceedings and immigrant detention is not punishment. And we can talk about that more if you guys have questions about this in the Q&A. 
Yet we have a strikingly punitive infrastructure of detention, which raises the questions, can building them, buildings themselves define the nature of punishment? And what is the work that detention facilities are doing? Texas is a place that incarcerates more migrants, uh, more non-citizens than any other state in the union. Here you see the extent to which the entire state is a staging ground for immobilization. Throughout most of the 20th century, Texas did not have all of those dots that you just looked at. In the 1970s, the state had three publicly owned and operated detention facilities. And this is a map that I don't expect you to be able to read, but it's just showing you that there are key um, sort of political and economic changes, whether it's the Illegal Immigration Reform and Immigrant Responsibility Act of 1996, whether it's um, 2001 and the legislative changes with the Department of uh, Homeland Security and ICE being funded and inaugurated, and also all of the money on the left that the private prison corporations started to uh, use to lobby Congress, and indeed congressional change, which starts in 2004 with the bed quota. So I wanted to sort of just put some of those changes alongside the footprints amassing in Texas slowly throughout this period as the infrastructure of detention um, increases over time. While in general, immigration scholars and activists have spent time analyzing policy and politics, we must reflect on the fact that the buildings outlast current administrations and that building contracts and building industries shape immigrant enforcement and detention practices on the ground for years to come. It's also important to highlight the key role that private corporations have in assuming the design of detention space. In comparison to approximately 15% of the US prison system, an estimated 30, uh, 73 or more percent of the migrant detention system is privately owned and operated. Corporate innovations include, for example, reduced construction time from an average of five to six years for a publicly funded and constructed detention center to one and a half to two years or less. And fast construction is a strategy that can curtail public engagement amongst other things. Geo Group, for example, has housed a, quote, design-build component into their corporate structure, which means that in-house designers and construction companies oversee the building from start to finish, as well as the long-term management of the facilities. In light of the lack of information that such companies like Geo Group provide to us, we can turn to this source, the American Institute of Architects Journal, the Justice Facilities Review, um, to get a little bit of a sense of what some of the design trends were in the 1990s and 2000 when all those footprints were being amassed in places like Texas. Throughout the 1980s and 90s, uh, jurors from this uh, uh, journal repeatedly discussed a trend toward designing, quote, non-normative environments also referred to as, quote, the hardening of facilities, relying on small dark cells and caged recreational spaces. So what you're looking at here is an example of what would qualify as outdoor space. Um, it's simply a room that is attached to a larger pod, but because it has that clear story window, it's considered to be uh, outside. Uh, they also talked about an absence of natural light, increasing reliance on, quote, borrowed light, where skylights and clear stories are used to channel indirect light in lieu of windows. They talked about har harsh fluorescent lighting, the concrete floors, crude signage. A major thing that was discussed was also minimal person-to-person -person contact, achieved by an increasing reliance on, quote, the indirect supervision concept. So video visitation and non-overlapping circulation spaces being designed into the programs of these facilities. And of course, today, these technologies uh, strip inmates of continuous human contact and contribute to a sense that they're always being watched while also interminably isolated. So these are quotes from that review. Feelings were that once a facility is toughened, there may be no going back. It's difficult to rescind philosophical and architectural decisions. Or the behavior of those confined and the response of those who operate these facilities will be directly influenced by the built environment. It's important for us to briefly talk about ICE and their design standards. Um, this is a manual that was published in 2007, and it's available online to give us insight into the position the government takes vis-a-vis -vis design. Uh, the manual has information about ICE's, quote, organizational, operational, and functional requirements with detailed specifications for ICE employees. 
such as, for example, plans and dimensions accompanying um, offices, ICE administration office. You can see there the window placement, the furniture placement. However, the manual does not provide detailed specifications for the most critical aspect of the design, the detainee living quarters. So the detainee living zone, um, which is the red zone, is contractor responsibility. So ICE controls the amount of daylight in its own offices for its own personnel, but it deems corporations as better suited to determine migrants' architectural standards. It's precisely this lacuna at the heart of the program that severs the awesome power of the government to detain from the physical environment in which that power is exercised, suggesting a moral abdication by the state. Through these sources, we can get a sense of the architecture of detention, but to what extent does the building itself determine experiential outcomes? How bad can a bad situation get? Where between architecture and subjectivity does incarceration happen? I want to share two stories um, very, very briefly. Uh, first is a, a man that was held at Pearsall, Texas, a 2,000-person all-male detention center. And you see here a plan of Pearsall with very typical uh, categorization and classification of prison design used uh, to, to organize its spaces. Miguel is an asylum see seeker from Panama who spent four months in Pearsall. And as you heard from the other speakers, um, the detention uh, experience was one point along his journey, which you see as indicated here. Um, after his crossing here and his running with the Zetas right before that, and he uh, was facing extortion in Panama because he was actually a successful musician. I asked Miguel to draw his pod because I wasn't able to get access to Pearsall. I was uh, tried, and I, my taxes helped pay for it, but I wasn't able to get in there. Um, and so he did, and he explained here the large rectilinear space. Um, you can see here the uh, bunks. These are bunk beds lining the walls. You can see here the uh, long tables that are used for eating with a television on each end. This is the outdoor recreation space that I showed you the photograph of. Bathrooms over there, a little room in the corner over there for multi-use purposes, sometimes punishment, sometimes prayer, um, and the entry door here. A uh, hundred men, three to 24 hours a day, seven days a week uh, in this pod. There's almost no opportunities for them to be in other spaces or to migrate to different parts of the building. But one of the most amazing things that he told me as he was drawing this is that Finally, after being there for a little while and achieving solidarity or some kind of friendship with some of his bunk mates as they got to know each other, that one of the management strategies was to reshuffle the men into different pods. So what you see here are all of the different rooms that he was sent to, DN, DH, DA, FB, DA, in the four months that he spent in Pearsall. That story um, of Miguel's is back in 2014. I have a more recent example that I will share with you from 2019. Um, I'll refer to this woman as R. R's journey included seven months of moving from San Salvador to Costa Rica to Tapachula to Saltillo to Juarez, where she waited due to Trump's Mexi uh, stay in Mexico program, which we just heard about, uh, for two months before her number. Her number was 10,980 was called. When she arrived, they were calling 7,000. So she had to wait for from 7,000 to 10,980 to be called until she could start her formal asylum process. Once she crossed the border to apply for asylum, the reason, by the way, that she was applying for asylum is because she was a police officer in San Salvador, and she was extorted and violently threatened by gangs to either work with them or to face the consequences. Um, she was admitted to her first detention center. She spent 10 days in what she called Paso Santa Fe and said it was a wake-up call. Here she drew um, a cell that is lined with beds, uh, very packed in. What I'm, what I'm talking about is here. So those little lines up there are all of the beds, one lined up next to another. She talked about how she was allowed to shower after nine days for five minutes. 10 women shared a cell. The floor would co was covered in roaches, dirt, and soiled napkins. And her request for a broom was answered with, ahí quédense así como las arañas que son. Stay like that, like the spiders you are, basically, you know, you don't, we, you don't need to have a broom and, and clean up the room. There's no use for that. Um, they also used the bathroom as a group every four hours. The second detention center she drew is below it, and she just was illustrating to me that, indeed, still the beds were lined up. She didn't finish drawing them one next to another. But she said it was a much better experience. The woman in charge of that detention center gave them a toothbrush, toothpaste, fruit, and enough water to battle the dehydration. 
After 10 days, she took a 14-hour bus ride to Sierra Blanca and lived in a tent uh, structure with 107 women, enclosed in an area with seven showers and six bathrooms. And every hour on the hour, for 24 hours, the guards did a bed, ca bed count, or person count, what they refer to as a bed count. Uh, in this detention center, um, which again you see here, the, the lines are the bunks, and that table up there is where they ate, all in one space. Um, in this detention center, she saw rats that were bigger than she'd ever seen before, uh, and scorpions, because they were out there in the middle of the desert, out there in Texas and endured 20 days. Her final destination, after a 16-hour bus ride with her arms and legs in handcuffs, with no bathroom, with no opportunity to take her medication for high blood pressure, was a Houston detention center where for 20 months and 20 days, with 36 women in a room where the light was never turned off, and when women at night tried to put a sheet over the light to dim the brightness, it was torn off by the guards, she prayed for her release, which was granted after she passed her credible fear interview. So first, we build the infrastructure that lays the groundwork then for these subsequent experiences. In 1970, Texas had three facilities, as I said before, and today they have over two dozen. So in conclusion, the fast production of hardened detention space has in turn created its own crisis of detention. Corporate strategists and government officials working with architects, engineers, and construction firms have worked for years to perfect these spaces. The government has granted corporations broad powers to make decisions about where to locate centers and how to house detainees. And as a result, private pr prison construction is not merely implementing a US political agenda, but shaping it for years to come. By analyzing the accretion of these facilities, which are evidence of current state-sanctioned torture, over time we can activate our spatial imagination and rethink in clear fashion what the relationships should be between people, the environment, and immigration policy. Thank you. Thank you. So let's do this. Uh, I have some questions, uh, a broad one and some, uh, one precise one for each of you. But instead of me asking and, and sending it back to you, uh, I'll ask and then we'll already open up the floor and collect a couple more questions just to get you know, as, as many voices as possible. And then you, know, you of course, each feel free to, to answer uh, 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 as you wish. So my, my broad question is, um, and, and Tanya, I think you, you already began to answer this, is how, is how you reconcile moral indignation and outrage with, with your work. Um, Tanya, as, uh, uh, I was wondering um, what the, the conversations or exchanges are between medical communities in the U.S. and Mexico about the, 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 the health and medical consequences of Remain in Mexico, whether there's exchanges, uh, uh, and, you know, anything you can, you can tell us about that. Um, Yolanda, uh, uh, besides the seeking uh, uh, um, refuge, uh, um, are there oral histories um, including folks like government, I know there are government officials quitting because of MPPs, not just immorality, but it's illegality. So are there uh, oral history projects documenting those uh, uh, perspectives as well? Medical professionals, uh, uh, dissident government officials or not dissident? Um, and Sarah, um, the new camps, so the shelters, but also the seemingly improvised but very dire uh, conditions in, on the Mexican side of the border, are there things that we're uh, 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 learning about them too? I think that would be important to, to hear. Does anyone want to? Hello, everybody. My name is Priscilla Chavez. I'm a scholar at Yale Divinity School. Um, wondering if do you, if you know of any other um, church organizations or related church-affiliated groups that have opened up any other um, either child detention centers or detention centers, period, um, since the closing of the 2019 uh, Baptist Church. Is, is that a hand up? No. no. Should, we, should we start with those? I, I can start with the question about oral history projects that may be interviewing government officials. 
We focused on asylum seekers, attorneys who work with asylum seekers, activists and advocates. That's who we focused on starting week after next, though we're going to start interviewing Mexican government officials. And that's partially through a collaboration with an art therapy professor from Lesley University who knows government officials. So we'll be also documenting at least that side. Um, about the church groups, I think that's a really good question because it was very fascinating to see how Baptist Child and Family Services was responding to all the <coughs> criticism. There is a brand new detention center being built in the direction of Tornillo, but it's being built by a private prison company. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know if, if you might know of church groups, nonprofits, opening detention centers. I think it's tricky for them. Opening detention centers. I, I don't know of them uh, opening detention centers. I, in Texas, the ones that I know of w that, are, that are church groups or like Casa Marianela immigrant shelters um, are places for people who are released from detention to stay or sometimes churches that will create <sighs> asylum, you know, will, will, will have a trailer mm -hmm. in, on the church grounds so that somebody who's resisting deportation stays on the church grounds. Um, under the sanctuary of the church, and ICE, there's a sort of an, an agreement, and ICE does not go into that trailer if the trailer is attached, appendaged to the church. Mm -hmm. But I don't know about a church running a detention center. Yeah, I think they're very vulnerable, which is what Baptist Child and Family Services found, that they're very vulnerable to public opinion, mm -hmm. where for-profit prison corporations don't, they don't, they don't care. Yeah. You know, they don't care. It's about profit for them. Um, I know that we have some uh, pediatricians who are crossing the border to provide medical care um, to some facilities in uh, Mexico and some organizations that are, you know, bringing doctors and things down from the states to do evaluations. And um, I think a lot of what they're able to do is identify and advocate for those families who are particularly vulnerable for you know sending a pregnant woman or a particularly you know family unit back and saying this child is sick and I'm identifying this so becoming um, this sort of medical advocate um, for when they are able to go in and identify you know sick or potentially um, particularly vulnerable family units um, speaking about sort of insidious separation too, um, there have been reports where families will send their children across alone because mm. um, they know that they'll be processed through ORR mm. and that they will be sent to a particular facility for children. You know, we talked about sort of the variation in care, but they are so worried about the um, about their safety and their children's safety that they're willing to send their children back across because they know that as an unaccompanied child their processing will be different. Uh -huh. um, so we're particularly worried about how this policy may shift the way, you know, people are very desperate in very desperate situations already. So we're worried that this will make people even more vulnerable. Uh -huh. So with Remain in Mexico, it, it, so that's if you're over 18, you're sent back to process asylum. In, in Correct. Mexico, so if you're eyes. over 18, uh -huh. then you're processed as an adult. Or if you're in a family unit, you're also yes. processed by CBP. Uh -huh. And then what happens too is that if you are in, um, say you're 17 in ORR, yeah. and you turn 18, uh -huh. you get transferred to an adult ICE-run facility. Uh -huh. That doesn't change the fact that all your trauma and your experience has been alone as a child. But because of your age, you then get transferred into an adult facility. So there are a lot of ways where in this very porous mm. system that kids are, and families are very vulnerable, both and, on this side and the other side. And we're learning about this from ORR. Um, well, some of the, the rules we know about, you know, how people are processed as far as by age, but, um, you know, people are receiving their, you know, exchange of physicians and people oh, coming yeah. through who are speaking to families, children, yeah. Who are speaking to to women and children and saying, uh -huh. "I sent my kid with a note in the pocket saying, uh -huh. take my child.'" Yeah. 
Um, I wish I knew more about the camps on the Mexican side of the border. Uh, one thing that in the most recent interview that I did that I shared with you, the second story I was sharing with you that she talked about is that in, in addition to the immigrant shelters on the Mexican side of the border, which are beyond capacity, yeah. so there very few people are able to actually stay in them, mm -hmm. and they're also um, very visible. When you're when you stay there, then in terms of gangs and extortion, they know where to go. Right, right. So it's actually a vulnerability to stay in the one place that's providing hospitality. Yeah. So um, she said that there was nowhere to stay. There was no formal camp. Mm -hmm. She was there for two months and 20 days with makeshift situations uh, at night. Um, and then I think there are, of course, informal camp-like places where people are gathering and clustering also to create a sense of security. Um, but I, th I think a lot of people are just figuring it out on a night-by-night, week-by-week yeah. basis. Yeah. Another thing, though, to think about in terms of what's happening to Mexico's built environment, and another subject I don't know much about, but a lot of research needs to be done about, is the buildup of detention on Mexico's southern border. Uh -huh. And we've yeah. seen that um, increase much in the last decade, uh, and in terms of just both facilities, um, informal and informal, and what it means for migrants, m many of them from Africa, mm -hmm. who have been traveling through South America and Central America and then are now getting stopped in Tapachula or places mm -hmm. in the south of Mexico. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of, of unknowns. I think that in some ways, a lot of the immigrant right activist group and investigative journalists uh -huh. are the ones right now who are, t who are risking yeah. um, uh, themselves by putting themselves in these situations to try to find some answers to these rapidly changing circumstances for people that are being corralled. Yeah. to get on, you know, like the, a the AAP tries to insert themselves into conversations about health and how to yeah, think about so minors, but I don't know how yeah. architects formally can or do that. Yeah. There is a man, Raphael Sperry, um, who has been for years working to have a, a group of architects um, uh, to publicly and vocally and loudly protest the design of any spaces of incarceration, um, immigrant detention, civilian prisons. Um, he's especially been, and his group, um, um, focused on uh, execution spaces mm. and chambers, which, ev you know, all of these plans at some point get stamped by an architect. And mm. also there is a movement within architects mm. to um, get the AIA, the American Institute mm. of Architects, to say that they will not participate in the design of detention and incarceration both with execution in mind and then more broadly. Um, there have also been mobilizations through some of the professional organizations to, for example, uh, denounce participation in the border wall. In the, and that would maybe be a little bit more toward the engineering side. Um, but so far, the AIA itself, as far as I know, has, not, mm. um, has been a bit ambivalent in its reception of some of the calls that the practitioners have levered. Um, in terms of public writing, I, I think that, you know, the more I see that is, again, in, in, in major media outlets that talks about the, the material reality of this, yeah. I think is, is helpful because we can know that, that there's injustices going on and we can hear that the situation at the border or within detention centers more broadly nationwide are, are terrible. But when we start to get a picture in our mind of precisely what those conditions are mm. and how people are experiencing them, where they're happening, it allows people, I think, to focus their energy in terms of dismantling the mm. system. One movement I've been very excited about, which is not spearheaded by academics or architects, 
is the movement of local communities to resist construction in their community. Mm. And we're seeing this more and more and more nationwide. Mm. So the most recent article I read was a few days ago in the New York Times about McFarland, California. Mm. And it is the people of that community, I believe it was in the Central Valley, it's predominantly a Mexican community, it's predominantly an agricultural community, who have rallied and protested the um, ICE moving in and opening up a major detention center in their mm. community. And they're not the first to do it. In Texas, Grassroots Leadership is an organization I've been uh, following closely who has worked tirelessly to get Hutto to uh, stop its contract with ICE. So you know, it might seem like, oh, if you have a community that fights and resists construction in one place, it will just go somewhere else. But actually, mm. the resistance, the collective resistance to this mm. is causing a major problem for these private prison corporations who the whole name of the game is speed and little public oversight. Mm. And the more that this happens and the slowing down of the construction and the opportunity for awareness to rise is really causing a problem for them. So it's not a little thing. Um, I think if anything, as academics and architects, we should support those efforts that are already underway locally rather than maybe trying to feel like we can invent some other way mm. of, of stopping the, the machinery of it. Mm. Mm. I was just thinking as you were mentioning that, you know, another reason why Remain in Mexico is so appealing is that there's not a lot of access. It's mm -hmm. so dangerous. There's not pictures of kids in cages. There's not protests. So it's another insidious way to take, you know, these same issues that have been going on on our side and putting them on, on the other side where there's a lot less visibility mm -hmm. and until, uh, um, except for people who are risking, who are taking a lot of risk to write those individual stories or tell those individual answers. It's really hard to get access to the inside of a CBP facility um, and you go at your own risk to many of these cities. So they know, they're, they know it's dangerous. It's not in the press. Mm. So these are very calculated um, types of moves. Mm. And to add to that, the other thing that MPP does is it makes it very difficult for people to get legal counsel. Mm. Yes. So in Etbasa, we're very fortunate that we have Las Americas Immigrant Advocacy who will cross the border and work with the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society in Juarez to give counsel to the people to work on their cases. Mm. So I think, I think just from what I see, lawyers mm. are are key to what's happening right now to lessen the suffering. Mm. Mm. Um, it's a question to all of you. I was, um, um, I was struck by um, Sarah's comment that these infrastructures and these, um, the whole apparatus outlasts particular political moments and that they have, have a long life. Um, it's also struck by the photograph that I think uh, Yolanda you showed of, of the hold the line. Um, and I think my question to all of you is, which elements of what we're seeing um, arises from the, the unique and shameless cruelty of this administration? And which elements have, have a longer history? Which elements uh, of, of what you're all witnessing um, actually reach back into the 1990s or even earlier. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Maybe I'll, I'll, that's a, that's a question that I've been asking myself. Um, how do you measure scales of injustice? Mm. What does it mean for bad situations to get worse? Um, is it, again, a scalar increase? Is it a qualitative difference? Um, one thing I was really struck by in some of the more recent interviews with people who have gone through detention is that even today, even though it seems as though the guards in the detention centers are acting with impunity and maybe a level that I didn't see five years ago, mm -hmm. um, there's still, according to people I've talked to, good experiences, quote unquote, like the one, like the woman who you know was providing them with basic requirements, which is which is in in your comparative experience of bad to worse con considered a good experience. Um, so I, I think it's a really great question. I, I think that uh, the, the possibility for, for what we're seeing right now to be taking place is something that has been in the making for a long time. Mm -hmm. It's not the result of Trump. Trump didn't just come onto the scene and all of a sudden, you know, all of this gross injustice is happening. That, those detention centers, which are supposed to be administrative processing centers. They're not supposed to be jails. Technically, they're not jails. Mm. We have criminal alien requirement facilities, car facilities, which are jails. 
for people who are apprehended um, at the border who cross illegally and who get a misdemeanor or a felony, they go into a different BOP-run facility. Mm. So ICE facilities are supposed to be administrative processing centers, but they're already designed and, and run with the spatial um, alliance of, of incarceration. So how do you measure how things have gotten worse? You know, one last thing I'll say is that I talked to a wonderful a pro bono immigrant lawyer activist, Denise Gilman, who teaches at UT and is busy, busy, busy in Texas right now, doing a lot of good work. And one of the things that she said is, it's, the problems are still bad. They were bad under Obama. There was a lot of deportation under Obama. There was a detention under Obama. But it's that the scale has gotten so much bigger. So I think we need more research to answer that question of these sort of qualitative distinctions. Now, the Remain in Mexico program, that is just clearly a travesty. Mm. I mean, that is something that did not exist before. Mm. Rights were triggered when you stepped into US soil. Mm -hmm. And now we are finding ways to dismantle the asylum process altogether and make sure that it's a different reality and that um, people have much less options, mm -hmm. much fewer options. So I mean, I think that's a clear shift. Mm. Um, and I think last, last thing I'll say is that I think we all know, if you, if just from reading the paper even a tiny bit, that literally the current administration wants asylum to go away. So, so the question is, why do we have asylum? Do we believe in asylum? And if the answer is yes, then cutting, you know, killing it by a thousand cuts is, um, is what we're currently w witnessing. So we have to fight for it. Mm. I'd say um, I'd add to that that, you know, again, I'm not a lawyer or anything like that. But my, from my experience and understanding is that, you know, again, these things are not new. But it's so easy to take large organizations like CBP where things are very, you know, in a government organization that, you know, you lax up a little bit on, on what, what is the... Um, you know, what are the, what's the rules from the top? What are the orders from the top? You give people a little flexibility. Mm. And then a lot, there's a lot of variation in care. And then you have ORR, which is run by a completely different, you know, department. And, you know, it's a little difficult to, co to coordinate efforts. People are getting mixed messages. Um, people are getting different directions from the top down. So you look across at some of these policies, like, you know, CBP is a detainment, you know, you shouldn't be there for more than 72 hours. It's just a processing facility. But, you know, there's a lot of variation. Now, so now we're taking these little pieces and creating these, like, micro kind of aggressions or, you know, these sort of jabs that make everything just a little bit harder and a little bit harder over time and, this, and then making things much more porous, much more inconsistent, mm. which just allows for these things to happen. And then we have, a, you know, in 2005, so we have a greater group of people going through and now more porous system. So it allows us to, allows these, you know, children and families and everybody to have a lot more, you know, horrible variation of experiences um, within this now very fractured mm. system. And you know, that goes the same for public charge, which you know, we can talk about also too. So it's like, that was always there, but now we've taken, so what can we take and just tweak it a little to make things much harder, mm. to make things much more chaotic? And that's sort of what we're doing to dismantle a process mm. that has been there for some time. Mm. And I think that um, social media in particular has made a huge difference because not, nothing is really new. You know, the first refugee camp in El Paso where there were children behind barbed wire was in 1914. So nothing is really new, but what has happened in recent years is that that level of reporting on it, of social media, of propaganda, has made it easier for people either to rise up against it or to say, this is great. Let's get rid of those immigrants. Mm. Can I just say one more thing? <laughs> the, the two things that really worry me are ICE wanting to withhold documents from entering the National Archives, um, the fact that they want to destroy evidence that includes, I wrote down a list here, Communication from public reporting on detention abuses, sexual assault, solitary confinement, mm. death in custody. Those are, those are all documents they do not want to go into the National Archive. Mm. And 
the retaliation against immigrant right activists. Those two things are, for me, the alarm bells that, wow, we're, we are consciously creating a black hole, mm. uh, hist a, a future historical black hole, yeah. where none of these questions will be answerable. Yeah, I, I remember in my, oh, please. Hey, um, first of all, thank you so much for your work. My name is Laura Cuellar. I came here undocumented when I was two years old. Um, my mom carried me in her arms. And um, I am also very passionate about the work, as all of you are. And my question is, um, as we plan these type of events on the Harvard campus or in our communities, um, how do we talk about them and promote them and engage the most people? Because I think it is a very heavy topic, and sometimes people um, it's hard to come to these events. I'm triggered. <laughs> I need I need to cry as soon as I leave here. Um, so, what is it that we can do to create more awareness? Is it not maybe it's not an event? Maybe it looks like something different. I think um, Dr. Leva, you mentioned social media. Mm. Um, so, what what can we do to build more um, solidarity and and create a movement to fix this or to to fight against? what you all talked about. That is such a great question because it, it is really hard to come to these events and it's really hard to think about these things and work, work with these issues. So, so when I started doing the oral history project, I went back into therapy <laughs> because it was, an, you know, and I'm, I'm proud that I took that step. It was very hard for me to keep, keep hearing the stories over and over, but what I learned over time was that there is such a thing as secondary trauma where you, t mm. you incorporate that trauma even though it's not yours, but there's also something called secondary resilience mm. Mm. where you learn about the creativity, mm. the hope, the beauty that people still carry within them mm. that allows them to keep going. When I work with the with the young moms from Guatemala or El Salvador or Honduras, I'm just, I tell them how much I admire them because of everything they do for their babies, mm. like your mom did for you, mm. right? And so that is one way, and to look for people that are creating alternatives. There is a house in Juarez called La Casa de, de Acogida, and it's not a shelter. They purposely do not call themselves a shelter. They call themselves a house of welcome, a house of transition. And they're big enough to house eight families, mothers and children. And the mothers are all waiting for their court dates, which are months away. And they are embroidering bags and selling them. And the moms get $20 and 15 goes back into the house. And the women say, we've never felt so independent before, even though they're in this terrible situation. Mm. So every week when my students and I go there to that house, that's part of that secondary resilience that it's, it's not all trauma, right? Mm. It's humanity still rising. Mm. Mm. Um, I think what I'd add to that too is, yes, I mean, it, it is a really difficult topic to face um, head on, but a little bit of what I mentioned too is, is you know, things like being a mentor in your community, um, having a middle school student or high school student, especially if you're bilingual or bicultural, um, can be a really strong and long-term influence on a child. and. You know what we what we know about toxic stress and you know chronic um, physiological stress on the human body, particularly children, can have long-term effects on their health, their development, their emotional development. But what's amazing is that the presence of a caring adult figure in that child's life can turn that around and prevent. You know, it doesn't prevent the exposure but the response and the long-term effects can either be reversed, reduced, mm. and that is just that caring adult in that child's life that they can count on. Mm. You know, oftentimes that is a parent, but that can be another adult in the community. You know, you don't replace a child's parent, but just having someone that will be there for them, that they can talk to, they can look up to, that who can mentor them, 
So I think there are other ways that, you know, like I mentioned, volunteer at a f food bank or a shelter, donate, um, you know, con contribute to an art project. There's like a, a really nice project that was started by students where they made butterflies for kids in shelters. And then it sort of spread throughout the country. So it's just like a way to use something like art or, um, you know, or your own personal time in a, in a doesn't feel as intense, but still can have a really good impact. Mm. I second all of those ideas. <laughs> yeah, and it doesn't have to be something very extravagant or grand. Before MPP, we could tell who had been through the Eleras because they didn't have shoelaces on, mm. and they were having a hard time walking, so our students started to make shoelaces mm. instead of buy them because it was a different thing to make them mm. and donate them to people who needed them. And that was a way to open up their humanity mm. in a way where they could come down to our office for you know 20 minutes and make a sh couple of shoelaces. Mm. Mm. Four detention centers within an hour of us here. And what we find is that offering people the opportunity to actually do things that make a difference, like accompany people to court or drive people to ICE appointments. We have lots and lots, I mean, we always need more volunteers, but offering people the opportunity to actually take an action gets more people to your events, too. Mm -hmm. Sure. And as humans, we want to be useful, right? There's a lot of really dignity and pride in being useful. Hi, uh, thank you. Very, uh, very inspiring and wonderful. Um, my question is building off of the past couple of questions, but what role do you see the humanities having? A lot of the stuff you've mentioned is activist, it's very human to human, but for some of us who you know, study in the fields of you know, literature, art history, cinema, what, what role do you see the humanities having? Even you know, Emerson Hall, philosophy, what role do you see it happening now? What role do you want it to have in the future? I, I think the humanities is essential to keeping our spatial imaginations active, alive, sharp, critical. Mm. Uh, history is absolutely essential right now to contextualizing the current moment and to not letting people get away with making up new narratives. Mm. So, I mean, the humanities has a huge role to play, all of the humanities. It's not superfluous, it's not, mm. it's, it's, it's narrative crafting, it's, it's figuring out how to contextualize and tell stories in meaningful ways that reach lots of people. It's amassing different kinds of evidence. Mm. So, you know, I think if anything, it's about the humanities being convinced that it has something to, to say about incarceration and detention and black sites and of trauma or however you want to put it um, so that those wonderful energies spent you know intellectualizing and contextualizing things come to meet these histories and these pressing issues halfway mm. um, so I'm very excited about you know the role of history in all of this the role of literature of film um, and I think it is it's a way to build solidarity it's it's another form of communication I think also the humanities, and I think about literature, and I think about film. You know, the, the artists are the visionaries of our societies. Mm -hmm. So I think having that basis in, in humanities allows us, and I'm a historian, so of course I want us to contextualize things historically, but I want us to envision things as well. You know, what is another society like? Mm. And I would say what, one of the reasons that drove the stop of the zero tolerance separation was all the media exposure. Mm -hmm. So they're really, as we mentioned before, there's so much role for um, media, whether it's cinema or print media. Some of these journalists and you know, people like I mentioned are sometimes the only people who can really rally the, the public. Like we said, you know, getting people locally to stand up and, and, and um, say, not in my community, to say this is outrageous. You know, the reason that those stories come to, it's not me telling you the research, it's, it's making a humanistic story that people can really relate to on a fundamental human level. 
um, that really can drive a lot of the change. So I agree, it's, it's really exciting and particularly important. I have a question which I think follows up on a lot of notes we've touched and a lot of uh, previous questions. Um, so Sarah, I remember maybe however many years, five, six, seven years ago when you started this project, uh, uh, you speaking of this uh, uh, sort of infrastructure which would need a project to justify it, right? So the detention centers and it wasn't quite clear, you know, I mean, what these were, were, were being built for. Uh, um, and you know, in a lot of ways, we're trained to read patterns. Those of us that are, you know, uh, think historically um, and so on. And there's nothing new. Um, and your work speaks to continuities. But I, I, I worry a lot about the extent to which um, that can actually obfuscate our understanding of some contemporary dynamics. Um, so I think if we went back to it. To, to 2016, 2015, uh, uh, 2014, I think, 2013, mm -hmm. and spoke of, you know, this is what will happen in the next six, seven years, we'd be shocked, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You know, we're going to get this asylum, uh, all these, well, what we now know has happened. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the question is, uh, what futures can you imagine? Oh, gosh. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. That's just oh, dear. <laughs> I, do we really want to go there? <laughs> well, I mean, it's for you too. I had a so we have a wonderful um, immigrant shelter in Austin, Texas, called Casa Marinella, and they have been there since the '80s, I believe. And they do um, amazing work. Um, they don't just shelter um, formerly detained persons, but also homeless uh, migrants. Mm. Um, and the director, the executive director of that, I've been involved with them uh, for since I started this project. Um, and uh, her and I were speaking about the future. Mm. And um, the, the, the sort of darkest forecast that I've that I've heard was from her, which was just the the visualization of of just bloodshed and warfare mm. at the borders, just outright killing mm -hmm. um, that you know if you ha if it if it if the conversation shifted so much right now the conversation is trying very hard to convince us that migrants are criminals mm. and we've been trying to convince we the public have been trying to be convinced that migrants are criminals for several decades mm. if not the long century depends on where you want to start in the narrative mm -hmm. but if the conversation were to shift even more toward a violent extreme place you can almost imagine that it could be a language of war mm -hmm and uh, where migrants would be seen as the enemy. Mm -hmm. And I think that is the very darkest future forecast that, that my mind has gone to. Mm. Um, but when I see already some of the violence that has been taking place along the boundary line, it gives me pause. Mm. Um, because already some of the basic human rights and, and ideas of human dignity have been long abandoned. So I... I, I am afraid. Mm. Um, a positive future? When I, when I think about rethinking that spatial relationship between migrants, the built environment, and policy very broadly, I can imagine, and this is, and I'm stealing people's ideas. Again, I'm going to quote Denise Gilman, this, the same woman I mentioned before. This was her idea in a conversation. She said, why don't we have welcome centers? Mm. Um, she talked about how there's lots of studies that have been done that Asylum seekers who are paired with pro bono or not pro bono lawyers have very, very, very high rates of showing up for their court cases. Mm. That you know, absconding is not actually an issue if, mm. if someone has legal representation and is a part of a system and sees a clear path. Um, so she said, let's have welcome centers instead of detention centers, where people are processed, in, in, entered into a system, where information is taken about where their destination is, because many people come with a destination in mind, um, and tracked in a way to provide services. Mm. And still, their cases can be adjudicated, and it can be determined whether or not asylum is granted, mm. or whether or not, ultimately, they're deported. But we don't actually need to incarcerate them at all. Mm. So I mean, my mind kind of has this wide spectrum of future possibilities that I go with. 
in, in my version of the world. Um, you know, I also um, work away from the border too. So, you know, a lot of what I see are um, Latino, U.S. born Latino children um, with foreign born parents. So you have a really young generation of people coming up who are well aware of the, you know, atrocities and um, difficulties faced by their parents mm. who are growing up, you know, with the privilege of being U.S. citizens, of being bilingual, of being, um, you know, educated and sort of generations from now will become voters, will become professionals um, in a more, you know, sort of across our nation. And so I hope that in the grander scheme of things that as some of our children grow up, um, they will be empowered to make, you know, who will enter in, in, into government, into academia, into um, schools and, and as teachers and educators, and that, you know, that cultural shift will really affect um, how we um, raise our, you know, future generations and, you know, paint the landscape of the, the future more broadly mm -hmm. in this country. Um, but I think it's going to take time. And I think that it's, what's different is this sort of, again, the, the benefit and the problem of social media is sort of like the um, different silos of information that people receive and that people are being you know, taught and fed in very different ways. So everybody's history is a little bit different and everybody's version of the history is a little bit different, which can be, I think, potentially dangerous. But I do have hope that we have a very, um, you know, conscious and um, eager young generation of people who are coming up with a lot more broad ideas about what it means to be, um, what, what dignity, respect, humanity, equity, and equality mean. So. That's stepping away from the, the border. My idea of a future would be for everyone to have the right to stay home if they want to. Mm. The women I interview say, I would stay in my town, I would stay in my village, I would stay in my home if there wasn't violence, if there wasn't gangs, if there wasn't poverty. Mm. So from them, I know that that is, that is the ultimate future, the right to stay home. Are there any last questions, comments, thoughts? So have, have any of you successfully, successfully been able to go inside a detention center or not? I have. You have? Yes. OK, yeah, because I tried getting like a ministerial's license online and like doing all sorts of things. And they were like uh, the one in Pennsylvania. And they were very much like, you have to go through a six month long like security check through Homeland Security, which I know is complete BS. but. Um, it would be interesting to know like the process of actually getting into any of the detention centers. The, well, this is another way things have changed. I think the process has changed. But, so I started the research in 2015. And back then, um, there are ICE field offices, uh, a state by state. And there was a formal application. Uh, and because it's, you know, it's a tax, it's a, it's a citizen space, right? So we, we have a right to go into the detention center. Mm -hmm. So there is a formal process. But even then, in 2015, um, according to the community organizers that I knew in Austin, people, certain people are blacklisted. That's what they call it. Mm -hmm. um, mostly the activists. Mm -hmm. So when you go through that formal process, then your, your visitation request can be denied. Mm -hmm. uh, but I was just starting my research. So <laughs> I didn't have that problem. <laughs> uh, yeah. So I don't know how it's working today. Um, and uh, one of the main tactics I seems to have for everything is just to make everything take forever. And then the person requesting, whether you're someone in an asylum process or whether you're someone who wants to learn about the asylum process, you just eventually give up. Mm. Um, they do that, that, you know, I've had that happen with me and FOIA 
time and time again. Mm. So, um, but I would look into it. I would because there should be a formal process that you can, you know, a, apply to and at least get into the the kind of entry area and have an informal consultation. The visitation rooms and things like that are accessible. Mm. So. Um, and maybe we we have both consecutively. Um, yeah, just in the interest of time. Hi, thank you so much. Um, I just mm -hmm. wondered in your act activism, do you see a role? Should people be trying to work with the politicians and get legislation? Mm. Is there even a chance? It's, it seems as if the administration, the president, is able to just do things by executive order and then it and then it goes to the courts but um, do, do you see a, any hope in mm. in having Congress for instance mm. um, pass legislation because we're supposed to be a country of immigrants and um, and the president seems to be trying to completely change that mm. thank you again uh, to what extent do you see activists uh, and people on the U.S.-Mexico border also interacting with other activists internationally and other areas that are dealing with problems of migration or refugees and stuff like that? Um, I, uh, what I've seen is that the groups like Grassroots and Raices in Texas are so inundated. Mm. They are so overwhelmed. Um, so I have had sort of other activist organizations that I've met in the East Coast in in different parts of the country say, we want to help Texas. And we don't, and, and I've seen the, the communication fall apart because the, the uh, not, this is not probably every you know, example of this. I think there are coalitions and I think there are uh, people who are working together. But in terms of having enough manpower in Texas to make that coordination happen and make it useful, that hasn't been uh, easy. Um, however, that is what, you know, that's because there's been so much crisis, but I hope those organizations keep checking. Every six months, check in and see, and well, there will be an opening, I'm sure. Mm. Um, and then for the other question, I think we can't give up on democracy quite yet. I mean, <laughs> you know. Uh, so, I mean, while, while there's still such a thing as voting, mm. you know, we gotta vote, right? And in terms of political change, I mean, the, whether, the, whether there's hope that that will happen or not, I think it's obviously a, a venue for, for change to happen. So I think that, you know, mobilization has to happen on all fronts from below, from the side, from above. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I'd say it's always good to let your local legislators know what you're not happy with um, and what, and maybe mobilizing when, we, when, I, when I think about, you know, refusing to have detention facilities in your community. You know, what are smaller ways that um, you can really make impacts in your own community? Um, are maybe more strategic and may have a sort of shorter time of, to turn around to actually see change. Um, and again, I, I also think that you know we still have to just you have faith in our in our systems. But again, in the meantime, you know we have su such a strong coalition of people fighting back with um, the lawsuits and things like mm -hmm. that. That seems to be the battleground on a larger scale. But I think on the more local scale, it's um, you know like what you mentioned is sort of small pieces of really strategic mm. ways that you can kind of block things from happening in your own community. Um, as far as the other question? Um, the International translation. Oh yeah, I, um, I also think that from, from what I've, I've heard with, with physicians and stuff when on the border is that people, everybody wants to help and people want to kind of hone in on where the action is. Mm. And I think, um, you know, realizing where our local communities are um, where there, you know, there may be a detention center or a, or a, um, a shelter, a, you know, a welcoming shelter where people, a respite center where people come out of that may be in your own community, um, I think is sort of a better, um, more strategic, more impactful way of having, um, of having effect. Um, 
So that's what I would say about that. And just to add a little bit to the local part, it's not only detention centers, but there's also border cities that have flights leaving in city-owned airports that are deporting people. And we didn't even talk about the newer policies of, you just know, deport it. Yeah. PACER and everything that is kind of speeding up the deportation process. Mm. But if we're talking about local politicians, we have to put pressure on them not to allow these kinds of things to, that can be very hidden. Mm. Mm. Parting thoughts? I just, you know, I think conversations like this are good right now. I, I had the thought the other day that it would be amazing if the New York Times published uh, an article every day on the front page about current conditions in detention centers because mm. they do every now and then put something in there, or not just the Times, but mm. um, but that would that would clearly be a way, like these conditions would would not be allowed to persist mm. if it was vocal and loud and present and constant. Mm. So you know I think that academia has a role to play. I know that that a lot of activists um, are focused more on on public and, and immediate action for very, very good reasons. But I, I'm excited to see academia kind of come to the conversation, um, and I think more of that needs to happen. Mm. I would agree. I think that, you know, there are strategies to everything, and people knowing what their strengths are, what their connections are, and what they contribute in their own way, um, you can be really strategic and you can affect change that way. So I think really reaching out to networks, thinking about what, what can you do, who do you know? Because like that's what they're doing, right? They're mm. looking strategically, where can I shift things in a way that'll make things more difficult, that'll make things more dangerous? You know, I think we need to come back with that same sort of very strategic, very strong approach. And I, I do agree that academia is a really um, important piece of that. So I just have one question as my ending. So what you gonna do tomorrow? <laughs>